Uh, good evening, welcome to the July IGDA Scotland meetup. It is very warm, apologies for that. <laughs> um, just before we start, get started in our little session, we're going to do a few quick sort of housekeeping shout outs. Uh, tonight we are sponsored by Codebase, who are hosting us, and Resonate Festival, who are, have given us some tickets for raffling, as you may have heard earlier. So they are currently, is it three pairs of weekend tickets we've got available? Uh, three pound for a single ticket and ten pound a strip. Um, we've got a couple of events happening at the sort of end of July, beginning of August. So, Dare to be Digital's happening the first weekend of August. Um, the Edinburgh Games Symposium is hosting a little day there on the 6th, which I think is this Saturday. Um, Digra and the other one that I can't remember are doing a joint conference in the first week of August. And we, at the IGDA Scotland, will be hosting uh, Adrian Shaw uh, and a special event in Dundee on the 3rd of August, which is a Wednesday, so hopefully some of you will be able to make it along. Um, well, as always, we are always looking for uh, volunteers, so please give us a shout if you're interested in helping us out at any events. We'd really appreciate it. And just a quick thank you to the people who are helping us out today. So just quickly get started, I'm Jamie, I'm one of the board members, I'm an audio guy at a company called Team Jumpfish in Dundee and I'll be doing this for you. Um, if the guys on this want to sort of introduce themselves. I'm Will Morton, I am co-director of Solid Audio Works which is an uh, audio production <coughs> company for games based in Edinburgh Stroke Fife. <coughs> um, I'm Rafael uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Grodos. Uh, it's a company based in Edinburgh that develops uh, audio software uh, for, for films and games, post-production, as we use a lot of uh, games and films, um, games like Diablo, um, World of Warcraft and, and things like that. And we are eight people, um, and my background is in audio, I'm a sound designer, engineer. Hi, I'm Matthew Smith, uh, co-founder of uh, Squarepeg Games, an indie company based in Edinburgh, which is doing nothing audio related at all at the moment, and <laughs> for a long time, until recently, I was audio director at Rockstar, which is why I have something very interesting to say about audio. <laughs> so we're just going to start with the usual bog standard question. So how did you get your sort of start? What made you interested in getting involved in audio for games? Um, do you want to start, uh, Matthew? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, mine was kind of random. I was uh, doing something non-games and non-audio related and keen to get into games. I was working for the civil service doing kind of baby techie DSP related things and was keen to get into games and didn't really know exactly which but I wanted to and it's pretty much a random chance that someone I knew was working here for Rockstar doing um, audio programming on the kind of tech side and in fact I'd seen the job and suggested he apply for it because he knew something about audio and I didn't so he came up and did it and um, then said they're looking for someone else. Um, you totally don't need to know anything about audio and games, you just bluff your way through and you'll be fine. So I applied and got the job doing kind of, to begin with, on the, on the quite techy end of, of audio and over the years just kind of gradually progressed into um, the non-DSP, non-hardcore tech bits and more sound design and more general audio munt. And uh, just kind of, so essentially drifted into it like that and learned very much on the job. And I think audio and games is one of those, one of those things that I think, particularly back in the day, um, like 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I started, was kind of small enough and made up on the spot enough that you could very easily bluff your way through and try and kind of discover it and work out what you liked and what you didn't. So it's a very kind of gradual progression into it and growing into all the different kind of elements. Um. <clears throat> I did. Uh, I started. I did a bachelor's in uh, music technology and acoustics because I like music and computers. Um, so when I finished, I did a bit of post production for commercials, uh, allocation sound, a bit of dialogue editing, a bit of music, a bit of everything. Then I, would, I was a bit bored, so I would do some more creative. So I moved. Uh, I'm from Greece, so I, I started in Greece. I worked there a bit for two years. Then I moved here. I did the masters in sound design at the University of Edinburgh, and then my final project was Dehumanizer, so it's the product we start now as a company. People liked the, the product and it was free originally. So um, then we started improving it, we started selling it, it went well, and then that's how I started the company and started being used in a lot of games. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how I started. Cheers. <clears throat> um, I sort of knew fairly early on, in, when I was about eight years old in 1986, 
um, for anybody else, I don't think anybody else is probably this old, but um, I'd got um, Hypersport on the Commodore 64, and when I'd loaded that up when I was eight years old, it played um, just the most amazing music I'd ever heard as an eight-year-old, and at that point I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, so for the, me the next umpteen years, it was, you know, I did as much as I could in my own time learning music and you know, sound effects and whatnot, and it was only um, in 2001, I think, I'd seen an advert for DMA Design, um, who I knew as the creator of, creator of Lemmings, um, and they were advertising for a dialogue editor, and I applied and got the job, and when I actually turned up for work, they'd been renamed Rockstar North. Um, <clears throat> so I started as a dialogue editor, moved into sound design, and then as Grand Theft Auto grew bigger and bigger and bigger and the dialogue requirements grew exponentially, that, that became my sole focus. Um, ended up sort of handling a, a lot of the dialogue stuff and then decided it was time for a change after GTA V, which is sort of 12 or 13 years of, of Grand Theft Auto. Um, and then at that point, me and another ex-Rockstar colleague set up a, a company, Solid Audio Works. Um, and since then, We've worked on a couple of indie games and got a couple more indie games in the in the pipeline, and have gone into working on titles for EA Sports. So it's a bit of a change going from from uh, cars and guns to American footballs, but uh, it's it's been fun nonetheless. Cool. So it's kind of quite interesting that uh, at least two of you started on the more sort of tech side of things. I mean, it's usually we, a lot of people who want to get involved in game audio. They usually really want to be musicians and composers. So it's quite interesting, even yourself, sort of coming in from a dialogue perspective, which is something that's not really taken off until the past maybe five years or so, and GTA itself kind of popularised. But in that regard, I mean, what sort of developments have you noticed in your careers or coming up that you think are quite interesting, or any changes that you've noticed in the past couple of years that have made things really either easy for you or just generally get you excited? <laughs> Um, it's really, really geeky, but the the, 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 the big mind-blowing thing for me was seeing Isotope RX um, and doing repair stuff, which is by far the least interesting thing I think I could ever talk about publicly, but it was, um, <laughs> it was, it was kind of, it reminded me of when I was a student and was working with recording on tapes and, you know, s snipping things, taping it back together and learning how to bounce down because you only had 16 tracks to work with and, and syncing MIDI with SIMT, it was just a nightmare. And then you go and you see Pro Tools being demoed for the first time and it's it's like, that's it, mind blown. And then it was kind of like that transition, seeing what you could do with, with um, Isotope RX, actually, you know, going in deep and really cutting bits of sound out was, was just phenomenal. So it's, I'm sorry, these things excite me. <laughs> <laughs> um. What excites me now, I think, is that audio becomes more important. Um, I think in, in comparison to the past because of uh, VR, people appreciate, start appreciating more. Um, that's one thing. The other thing in terms of technology is that, yeah, it's getting easier. There are more tools, more, more things that allow you to be more creative and focus less on the, on the details and actually, you know, make something. Mm. Make it sound like you want. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think one thing that I had kind of been part of the transition of was, I think when I started it felt like you had to fake a lot of audio stuff and the systems weren't really there to build an entire world that was kind of honest if you like and you, you kind of hatched things in and you, everything was quite kind of fudged and made to sound how you wanted but not how the real world was and I think it's now possible, it's the same in a bunch of other areas as well as audio obviously, but you can, you can be quite honest in making a world sound real and I used to love trying to push for that, everything that's kind of lowest level sounds right. If you, when I joined, if you kind of shot a gun and a bullet casing bounced, you'd play a sound of three bullet casings bouncing. And now you actually kind of model the thing bouncing and you just get lovely, natural, real behaviours out of trying to be quite honest about all of these days rather than trying to find the cunning, clever way to make something sound real even though you're utterly faking it. And then obviously in the last month you just cover it with faking everything as well anyway. <laughs> but for doing 90% real I think is, is really nice and I found that a really kind of satisfying change I think in the last 10 years. Just kind of bring up what Orpheus was saying, I mean have any of you done any work for VR titles or looked into it yourselves or is it something that you'd want to do if you've not done so already? Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's something that we, we've got an indie project in the, the works that's going to support VR, um, so we've, we've only very, very gently touched on it, but 
what we have seen, um, we've seen bits of uh, Valkyrie to another guys there that are working on that, and from what we have seen, it's been a real, prob probably the next isotope RX to me. Um, <laughs> And it, for at least for VR, when the first time I was exposed to that was playing on a Vive um, a long time ago, and then playing the portal, the portal demo for anybody that's that's seen that or played that. Um, and there's a bit in that where the, the doors open and you can you see beyond this little room that you're in, and it just felt like yes, we can actually really take world modeling to the next level with this. You know, it was a, a bit of a you know actually like having your eyelids physically lifted open to make sure you can see it properly. Um, so yeah, it's, it is a, a very exciting development for sure. It's, it does feel like we're all starting from a level per, a level playing field now. You know, everybody, no matter how long anybody's been working in the industry, everybody at the moment starting starting from scratch on VR. Yeah, it's uh, it's very exciting. I mean, I've tried most of the the, the most popular headsets that are out there. Um, I think it's yeah, it's the future definitely. Um, and uh, in terms of audio, I mean, uh, our, the tools we're making, we, we always think that how could this be used for VR for real time. So for example, make the humans that makes your voice into monster creature sounds. It would be good if, you know, in your environment, you are a monster and you sound like a monster because sound is very important. And, and one thing that I noticed when I tried uh, one of the headsets is that actually the only thing that doesn't feel that real is sound because you don't hear your, you know, your body movement, you don't hear your footsteps. So uh, that's something interesting and definitely there's a lot of uh, space there to explore and, and you know, the things to be proved and it's exciting. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. I, I've been doing VR stuff for the last two months now as the kind of main full thing. I haven't done a single audio thing yet, so that's nice. <laughs> and, um, and it's clearly so exciting what you could do with it and the massive difference it'll make. I certainly felt um, on kind of GTAs, you were, we were pushing what you could possibly do to make that environment feel real and feel like an entire world there and you felt like you could make you could make it better and you can make it more real but can you really justify it can someone really in a, in a third person game can you really tell that it sounds different when you're by a wall versus near the floor or in the ceiling like can you really get that kind of spatialization is there any point doing it you can model it but is there any point and in vr it's so obvious that that's exactly the kind of stuff that makes you feel properly grounded and stops you feeling like the whole thing's broken it's that sense i was I was late to VR, I mean, only about three months ago, and I was always a little bit sceptical like a year ago that everyone raving about how present you felt, and I thought, really, will you? I'm sure it'd be good, and I've been absolutely blown away by just the fact that it doesn't feel, it just removes that middle layer. You are just in another space, and it's definitely, I've not played anything I think hit the kind of audio highs yet that some of, I've been quite amazed in some of the VR stuff I've done that I've done that scene that's less photorealistic but I kind of thought if you're not going to be photorealistic because it's going to seem really broken and actually you see cartoon stuff you see a lot of things like in the in the lab like cardboard cut out characters it doesn't matter that they're, they're cartoon you're still there with them and I think there's a huge amount to be done with audio making you feel properly in that space and like it's absolutely real um, so going back to that sort of things about um how we're putting sounds in game. Is there anything we can know? Well, you mentioned the first thing you heard on the sort of Commodore 64 was the thing that really drove you to want to get involved in games. So, is there, have there been examples of things that really made you think that's really cool? How did they do that? I want to know how that worked in that game. And we spoke about VR and how the implementation side of things is really interesting. And what you also mentioned, the specialization aspect of that is really important and really crucial. So, as much as maybe slightly tech theory again, like sort of RX or anything that you've heard say recent games, upcoming games, or even like stuff from the 90s, if just went, that's really cool, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always things that, I mean, I think audio generally is, you know, the people that make audio, the people that use it, generally are very good at hiding how clever they are. <laughs> and, you know, the, you only rarely sort of see behind the curtain. Um, we, it was, it was actually nice, I think, Matt, you were, you were at this with us. We, we actually went and met Randy Tommy came to Edinburgh. And um, it was nice to hear that some of the things that we were doing in, in games tech, that they were doing at Skywalker, um, you know, using MIDI sequences and whatnot to randomize chunks of audio to build train sounds and things like this. And, you know, without being told that they were doing that, it was, you know, you just assume that they just record it, sync it, and, and that's it. Um, so yeah, there's, there is a lot of stuff where you do get your eyes opened. Um, as far as things that have personally really impressed me, in, I mean, 
there's, thinking back to Xbox, the first Xbox generation there was um, uh, that was that was really the the first time I was exposed to online multiplayer gaming, and there was Rainbow Six Three, um, and it became apparent how useful sound could be um, for actual gameplay purposes, not just for setting moods and you know controlling emotion, but for actually you know being able to play games blind, if you will. And you know there were times when you, people in your team would would sit in a an area that they knew they were safe, but they couldn't really move and whatnot, and they would have to wait and actually listen for where people were before they could stand up and pop a grenade over a wall. So it was, it was that sort of thing where, you know, it, it, it was another layer of immersion going from, from previous generations. It was really nice to, to, to sort of witness that and see, see the potential for that. Um, something that I noticed that I, that I saw recently, I went to develop a conference down in Brighton and then the, there was a talk about quantum break. And it was interesting how they used uh, sound uh, to, to trigger animation. So that was something that uh, interested me very um, a lot because uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how they, so they analyzed sounds, different uh, explosions or different uh, sounds to create all the uh, fragments and different um, weird things that were happening in the game. So um, that's something that interests me a lot, how to, you can use sound, analyze sound to, ten, to generate different content like animation or things that are happening um, in the game. Um, I think one thing, this isn't super recent, but from saying I was liking kind of game audio being quite real and coming from the real things that are happening, I think we got to the point certainly where it felt like we'd done that, not so well, but well, and then it was almost a shock to go back and look at other media and look at the film in particular and just see how much you can completely lie and strip out and kind of the likes of Walter Murch is talking about how little you need and that kind of thing. I remember when we were working on GTA V, looking at the start of um, the film Drive, when the, the kind of first getaway bit, and looking at just how nonsense the audio is in that, and thinking how you could try and make an interactive game be as focused on what it should be. And you watch that and there's no car engine for like two minutes. Um, you just play a quick shot of a helicopter and then suddenly the car engine's up 24 dBs and you never noticed anything changed. And it's just massively wrong and entirely stylized and nothing like what's actually happening. And realizing you can completely get away with that. And even though it's been nice that we felt like we getting to the point where you're being honest and you can make this whole world feel natural, then trying to layer on top of that how you can completely strip it out and have people not notice and try and create that kind of super stylized thing interactively by going back almost to, to other media and seeing what they do when they've got in some sense no constraints because it isn't interactive. It's kind of interesting that you bring up the film comparisons. Um, it's a lot of the times people compare games to films, you, you know, all the, sort of the cinematic experience and stuff like that, and it's kind of about you were bringing up there with driving that they do as little as they can, where in games it sometimes feel that you have to, oh, everything might need a sound, you have to build up all this soundscape, especially what we're seeing these days, what we're able to, just kind of throwing everything to the power you can. Um, but it's kind of, some of the stuff that I found when I was going for uni and stuff, a lot of the stuff is quite hidden behind the curtain, and you do get the books that everybody's read, and you see the sort of interviews with Randy Tom, and, going over sort of stuff like Wally -E and Jaws and all that, but a lot of the sort of techniques I've found are quite difficult to grasp, you kind of work out yourself. I mean, is that what you've found yourselves that's been mostly kind of, will this work, stick them out in front of it, see how it goes, running through plugins, or have you found any sort of interesting books or videos or stuff like that that's kind of helped you get where you want to be? I think for me it's genuinely been a case of experiment and see what happens. Um, I mean, subtractive synthesis is really sort of easy to understand and, you know, you, you can kind of predict exactly how something's going to end up and if you've got a sound in your head you can work out exactly how to build it. Then you go into FM, it gets a bit more, a bit more unpredictable and by the time that you're, you know, working with granular stuff and spectral synthesis and all sorts of things like that, you, I mean, you, the, the world is really an oyster so a lot of the time if you're you know, wanting to do something uh, non-real, you've just got to get your hands dirty and do what you think is going to work, and if it doesn't work, do something else. Um, so there is a lot of experimentation for for that sort of thing, which is which is great because a lot of sound guys, a lot of sound people are uh, creative people, so it's a, a very satisfying part of the job, I think. Yeah, as Will said, um, uh, so I talked recently about the sound of uh, Star Wars, the the video game. 
and they were saying that um, one of the problems they had is that they couldn't uh, find exactly how uh, some of the original sounds of Star Wars were made. Um, so, I mean, they have this book, I don't know if you've seen it, the, the, the classic book that everyone, that the sound has with uh, different patterns and things like that. So that, that was the reference, basically, to design most of their sounds. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely a process of experimentation. You have to, you know, use different tools, record stuff, process stuff, use different techniques. It's always the part that is the most exciting one, and, uh, you know, it's definitely fun, and you can always come up with, with new things. But, I mean, there are a lot of resources that you can find online and um, how to create this sound or how to create the other sound, and different tools allow you to do different things. But, yeah, it's always a creative process. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I quite agree. I think it's that experimenting. Like there are just a million resources out there, but maybe more. But I think I've certainly had an audio stuff when I thought I've got a good handle on something. I know what the right answer will be. I'm just almost certainly wrong. Um, and just ex exploring and trying something out and not assuming it'll work and doing it at the last minute because it's going to be easy and work. But doing it early and just trying random things out and exploring around what you think the right answer is. And I also think it's it's such a great field to be to work with other people that are also exploring because. I've never found a way of uh, a resource to go to to get good info versus chatting to like five other people that are doing broadly similar things and bouncing ideas off them. I think it is that kind of, it's, it's a technical field and it's a creative field and it's uh, exploring bouncing ideas of other people is the way the best things I've ever seen get done, got done. Yeah. I'll just add to that. It's just brought back a few memories from when Matthew and I were working together. Um, quite frequently, you know, you'd be trying something new or a new method of doing something or a new method of implementing something and quite often you'd, you'd have such self-doubt that it was ever going to work and the, the sort of mantra was just stick it in and judge it when it's in the game because you really couldn't evaluate something until it was actually in and until it was working because, you know, no matter how good or how bad something sounds in isolation, you've got to really see it to picture before you can judge it. Um, just kind of going back to sort of working with others, um, there is or at least has been the image of the sound guy being this sort of way in their own sort of studio just making noises, doing whatever they want, and kind of producing stuff, and it's sort of like this mystical black boss sort of thing. Have you found that's been the case when you're working things? And have you found that working with people outside of your discipline has there been any sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, stumbling blocks that you've found trying to communicate with them, like sort of say any verbiage that you use and they may not understand, and things like that? Um, I think there's always going to be issues of communication between people from departments um, and fortunately I, I've always thought that the audio people are the people that know, know most about a particular game. If, if, you know, if you want to know something about how a game works you've got to go and ask the audio person because you know, the audio person needs to know how this works, how that works, how that works otherwise you're not going to get any sound in there. So you know, fortunately we're always in a, a good position where we, we know how everything works. Um, but the, um, with communication, I think as well, you, while you're doing that, you do learn how other people interpret sound and how other people describe sound. Um, there was a project that we worked on some years ago where we'd received um, a request to make guns sound more dangerous. Um, and we, you know, the, the guns, in our opinion, sounded great. And um, it was actually, um, on my stag night, I'd gone paintballing, and there was a bit where um, I'd been. Th there was like we we're in a forest, and there was like structures made of oil drums, and uh, I was sort of hidden behind one of these, and then got ambushed behind from behind, and all I could hear was a click, 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 click of the paintball guns, surrounded by this huge booming that was as these balls were exploding on the barrels around me, and it was at that point I thought, well, it's not the guns that sound dangerous, it's the fact that this stuff's happening six inches from my head that sounds dangerous. So the, we know the problem was described to us as guns don't sound dangerous enough. The solution was actually make bullet impacts bigger. So it was uh, just a, a, another communication stepping stone to get over. Um, yeah, I think like the audio guys are usually a minority in terms of, you know, company is a small part of the company. And it, it, it's, uh, yeah, actually I was surprised that there would be so many people here to, today. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's always uh, yeah, it's challenging to communicate with, uh, with the rest of the team. Um, uh, I used to work for commercials and I used to post-production sometimes I had exactly the same, like it was difficult to, the producer was saying something, I want something that sounds a bit more like that and I had to figure out what kind of music I had to make and things <laughs> like that. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely um, a challenge, but also, yeah, as Will said, you need to know the whole project and, uh, and in order to, um, you know, um, because in order to work on the audio, you need to know the different aspects of the project, and so it's, people come ask you things, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's, uh, it's always exciting to, to be a part of this creative uh, department because uh, most people actually know you are, are creative and uh, when I go to conferences and things like that and uh, most people are really nice and really creative and like most of us have the same kind of um, interests and things like that probably music uh, musical background um, so it's a, it's a great place to be in a great industry as well yeah I think there's there's certainly a tendency for audio and games to be, to be the kind of last thing that's thought of or it kind of follows everything else kind of naturally or some people see, that, see it like that and it's quite often to, to see a, a new feature go into a game and no one thinks that it, that means it's going to need audio until right near the end and then it suddenly does and there you're having to do it and I, I used to find that kind of annoying, frustrating and blah 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 and, um, and there was a natural tendency I think people think that it just, the audio just kind of happens. I remember uh, on an earlier game, there was some like subway train, and as the subway train went around a corner, we put in some sound for it. So as it turned, it squeal, and we looked at the angle between two different train carriages and the speed it was going, blah blah blah, and hooked all it up, and it sounded grand. And then about a month later, the um, VFX part of the guys put in some sparks and did the same, but they just looked at some slightly different metrics. So the, the audio and the visuals just didn't quite tie up. And immediately, I got a load of bugs saying the sounds out of sync with the visuals. It's like, well, there were no, there were no sparks. These aren't. There is no metal grinding on metal here, people. These are little pixels that someone made up, just like we made up where the audio went. And you could never, can never get that into anyone's head that it wasn't an audio bug. It's an audio <laughs> bug. It doesn't tie in with the sparks. I can see them, and it annoyed me for I think probably years. And it's kind of not that particular thing, although apparently it still does. But, um, <laughs> but I realised after a while, it's actually a really kind of powerful thing because. People, I think, notice a whole bunch of what goes into games, and they don't notice most of the audio. It just, it's just happened. If you hear some things, because it must have actually been there, and people just take it for granted and assume that that's what the world is. And so the amount of control you have, control, power, over making people feel things or think things or believe they're in a situation they're not really in, I think it's hugely powerful for people actually paying attention and thinking, oh, this someone's added a sound effect for this. You'd, you wouldn't have half of that power, I think. I remember we were probably the same game. Um, I read a review when the game came out, it was like a massive review, and obviously it said like, the music's good, the dialogue's good, the guns sound as you'd expect in like one paragraph <laughs> and then on to the graphics. And, um, but then later on there was a bit where they talked about one particular mission and said how great, like, that, that it's, they described seeing a flash of lightning at some key point in the mission. I thought, hang on a second, I remember this, there was no lightning, because we tried to persuade someone that it'd be better if there was some lightning in this, and there wasn't, so we just added a crack of thunder. And this reviewer's mentioned this wonderful point where they saw this amazing graphical effect that looks great. Like, didn't exist, and that ability to make people think they've seen things they haven't seen is the flip side of the fact that people ignore it. And if you can get over it and calm down, you know, a decade will do it, apparently. Um, then I think that's a great kind of thing to get about audio. At least I don't know how true it is just now that it used to be audio people knew when they're doing their job well when nobody commented on it. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're yeah. seeing more people pick up on these things. Like I know everybody's gone to the rapture, like the sound design was quite commented on that quite a bit. Um, but kind of just a quick show of hands, who in the audience here is studying audio or working with games in audio, not necessarily just in games but audio in general? Uh, a few of these, maybe just about half. Cool. So at least some of you know what we're talking about, and others probably won't. <laughs> but no, that's cool. Um, so just bringing it back a little bit, um, audio is very competitive. There are very, very few jobs, and a lot of people, again, studying it or looking to make their way in the world of game audio. Um, what do you think are the best things, sort of entry points, things that people should be looking at, just so they can get a foot and say, yeah, I definitely want to do this. I have this. Please hire me. I think that enthusiasm is really, really undervalued um, from people that have applied uh, for jobs with us in the past. Um, a, a big, a, a, whenever people ask me this question, I always use this example, so if anybody's heard me speak before or has read what I've written before, apologies for going over old ground, but there have been times when we'd received, um, you know, we, I mean, we, we would get mailbags filled with applications for, for audio jobs and we would go through those and 
separate them out, and we, you know, we found um, demo reels which were which were good. It was sound replacement for uh, animation and old black and white film footage. And I was like, oh, that's quite good. And then a couple of demos later, we found exactly the same stuff on the disc. And we went through, and there was about seven or eight of pretty much identical demos, and we, we realised that it was. Um, uh, people that were just about to leave uni that were sending us their coursework to apply for, for jobs. And that's fair enough, but it was, you know, at that point where everybody's sending us exactly the same thing, we couldn't really decide what, was, what had been produced by the person and what had been produced by following guidelines. Um, and in the end, it's the people that always do things outside of the curriculum that, that are enthusiastic about it enough to spend their own time doing something, they get involved with teams or get involved with short films and whatnot, that have something unique that they can show. It's always that enthusiasm that, that you know, really stands out or makes the, that makes the application sparkle. Um, so yes, you know, quality of work is good. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, you know, we've, Matthew said it before about, you know, how we all got in this, into this industry years ago is very different from what the barrier of entry is like now. Um, and, uh, you know, so many people's work's so impressive, but it is just that little bit extra that separates, separates the, the people that are just good from the people that are good and enthusiastic. And, you know, people that work in games are usually people that like games, so it's nice to be enthusiastic about what you're, what you're going to be doing. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, a, a good portfolio, as Will said, is, uh, is very important. Um, and also, yes, yeah, as, as he said, like being very enthusiastic, but um, it's, a, it's a difficult industry. Um, so, I mean, the other thing that is good is uh, also do something very, very specific really well. So you can focus on something that you like. Um, for example, in my case, you know, I did something, one, a software, and I, it was a sound software, and I tried to work on this, and I was, you know, I got a bit lucky. I posted it online. I, I also, being on different forums, social media helps a lot because you can network with people like Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. There are several channels for sound designers, uh, audio engineers. You can network, you can meet people. Going to events like GDC, uh, develop, um, AES, Game Sound Con, also uh, really good because you get to meet different people, all the directors from different companies that might be looking for uh, for new hires. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of all these things and also luck, of course. But I mean, if you're good in what you're doing, and I think eventually um, you'll find something and uh, you can move forward. So. Yeah, I think the demo reel, like everyone said, is obviously key. But it's I think quite hard in games in lots of ways, and the audio maybe even more so because it's it's difficult to send someone that something that isn't a demo reel is actually playable because shipping someone a game they can play is just fraught with is this going to my computer blah 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 so sending a video is often a bit risky it's hard to know whether someone gets interactivity from that which is quite tricky and i think that does play into the get out there and meet people and chat to them because it is hard to sell yourself even on a demo reel i think um and i agree with being specialized on things but i think it's also being a little bit broad what's the kind of it's, it's like being a t-shape or something where it's kind of like a shallow a broad shallow knowledge and then a really deep specialism and i think as will says in audio um i think audio and qa are probably the two departments that know everything about our game yeah. and and in audio knowing not just how to be a good sound designer but it's you can just get unity and learn to code a little tiny bit and then make something that sounds good and that's going to be infinitely more impressive than just a bunch of raw sound effects so having that like very thinly spread out bit of knowledge, enough to have a conversation with someone about every other field, I think is a really key thing. I certainly used to value that way more when people could have a conversation around the subject rather than just know everything about Amazon. I mean, that's, it's an interesting thing that knowing not just your own field but others as well, especially in games where it is multidisciplinary and it's all interconnected. I mean, the stuff that I didn't realise I'd have to pick up on things like animation and coding systems, mm -hmm. just so I could to say to people, yeah, this is how I want it to work, can we make it happen, and that sort of feedback loop is really important, so it's not just, I can make a really cool sound, it's, I can make a cool sound that works in this game in this way when this happens, and it is, like what like you said, like making something playable, I mean, I've dealt with a few demo reels myself, and they are generally just all videos, nobody yet has sent me in, oh yeah, here's like a little demo of stuff I've done, and it's, it'd be nice to get it at some point, <laughs> but, um, so, Sorry, Just quickly on that, that goes back to the thing we were saying before as well, of working with other departments, and sometimes that audio being at the end 
if you want to sell someone else, if you want to sell an animator on hooking something up or making some effort to make it sound good, they're just as busy and overworked as you are. So if you can actually have a conversation where you understand what it involves to them and you know that it isn't easy and it isn't trivial and you can't just do something and you can sell them on, the animation trust me will look better if it sounds good. If you can understand every other discipline enough to sell it to the person whose help you need, then you're halfway there, I think. Yeah, back. yeah also, I mean, audio programming is a very um, interesting field. We've been looking for audio programmers for a while. It's very difficult, very, very difficult to find good audio programmers worldwide. So I mean that's another field that you know if you're good with audio and you learn programming, it's a it's a, it's a really good combination of things. But if you're a sound designer, you want to work with games and games, and you know some programming, that also very very it's very very helpful. Yeah, actually, just thinking about that, um, when when I started um, at Rockstar, I, I, I genuinely think at the time one of the things that helped me get a foot in the door was that. I was able to program basic apps in basic um, and at that point working on PS2 games there were so many manual repetitive tasks with batch files and put processing VAG files and whatnot that you know for, I'd, I'd knocked up an app that could, that could you know burst through this stuff and save a day's labor by doing it in an hour and things like that that you know, it's, it's a simple thing, but it is that, you know, if you've got these extra little bits that you can offer, it's, it's, it's never going to hurt you to be able to do that. So, so tangent that then, um, have there been any kind of, uh, so we call them workflow hacks that you've found, or sort of developed as you've went along? That, like, I know things like Reaper, you can do some scripting, so if you want to do batch exports and stuff like that, to a specific sort of fade or whatever, it's, you can knock it up yourself. Has there been anything, I mean, Office, obviously you developed your own sort of suite of plugins, <laughs> kind of tripping over my own tongue there, but has there been any of your sound sort of, that's really helped in that regard? Yeah, I mean, Reaper's been a massive thing. Um, before that, we were using a combination of SoundForge and Vegas, um, and then building plugins for those, and so they were telling us, well, we shouldn't really be able to get that to work, and we can't guarantee that, that that will still work in the next version, and eventually Reaper came along, and, and we you know, used that, and that's just a massive, massive godsend for, for time saving. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, whatever project you work on, you, when you, f you finish a game, you get it in the bag, it comes out, and then you come back, you know, a couple of months later, ready to start the next thing, and you think, right, now we've done that, we can remember exactly how we solved all these problems, which is great, but there's always another full set of problems that you've got to learn to solve. So it's, it's never a static industry, it's never, it's never a static set of skills, you're always, if you're forever problem solving. Yeah, that's why it's, a, it's an exciting industry, I would say. And um, also, um, I would say in my case, I mean, I started with Max MSP, which uh, is the uh, visual programming language that I used to make the, to make the humanizer. But uh, when I first started uh, my undergraduate, actually years ago, um, I, I hated it because uh, we just learned how to make, you know, different specific filters, like if I'm seeing the same and all this kind of thing. And I, did, I didn't really like it, but uh, here, I mean, I, I started to using Max MSP for sound design. And that was very interesting because you can create really unique um, sounds and um, really unique uh, kind of you know small kind of uh, software that you can use to to create any kind of uh, you know weird stuff you want. Yeah. Uh, I just read some emails these days, so it's kind of uh, <laughs> keep folders. I don't know. Um, I think making making your own tools or, or finding tools that are out there and getting a workflow and a pipeline that works is kind of the key thing to saving time in lots of aspects of sound design. Like Will was saying, you end up doing one thing and it's relatively quick, you think that's fine, then you've got 5,000 of these to do, and then you'll have to chain one again next week. Anything you can do to kind of script stuff up or have something that automates a workflow rather than thinking, oh, it's not worth half a day doing that, I'll just, I'll just do it all manually, we'll come back to, to save you. So um, this is probably more for Will and Matthew, but both of you sort of started the same company, very much AAA, one of the biggest games companies in the world, and you've now kind of taken a step back to a sort of degree, you're working in sort of smaller companies, but obviously, like you more, you still got a heavy workload, and Matthew, you're doing lots you of different hacks. <laughs> so I mean, how have you found that transition, going from a big company, big teams, like even having an audio team there, to maybe just being one or two people, or I'm not entirely sure how many people you've got in your, your own company? Yeah, it's, it's been a, a really, um, I mean, working at Rockstar for so long and working on Grand Theft Auto and helping out on other Rockstar titles has been 
an amazing, like, you know, a, a genuine dream come true. Um, but going solo and setting up solid audio works, we've ended up working on um, a couple of uh, uh, other big games, but then we've also been working on a couple of uh, little indie games and they've been really, really good fun. And I think the big difference is, is that working for a AAA um, company is that you, a lot of what you do is, is dictated and you're simply finding solutions for somebody else's um, shopping list. And um, when you're part of a smaller team, there's a lot more freedom that usually goes with that. And as a creative person, it's a great creative outlet. You know, even, even if you do the sound for you know, uh, uh, for a whole game, and then you end up throwing it away and redoing it again. It doesn't matter. It's the, you know the fact that you've had a lot more input into into the product. You you can take a lot more ownership of, of these things, and you can you know I mean you do feel really proud even when you know you go from a, a team of a thousand to a team of two or three. It's it's a, a fantastic a fantastic thing to, to to see these these games form and and, and be the daddy. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very much kind of swings around. I think I've been loving in the last like year or so because every day is just kind of radically different. And instead of um, knowing every chunk of work is going to take weeks to kind of see through, every chunk of work takes like an hour or two, or you've spent too long on it. And that's been absolutely brilliant. It's been great not just doing email, but doing some actual actual work um, has been absolutely great. And as Will says, you're kind of your sense of ownership of something when you've been the person doing the vast majority of all of it rather than making some decisions but handing bits off is absolutely great. The flip side obviously is that you typically, unless you get lucky, have a much smaller audience for that and are, and are seeing its kind of reach um, and not be anywhere near as great and in the, in the AAA world and, and um, working on GTA in particular was amazing seeing so many people know the detail of what you've done. Um, even if they thought guns just sounded as they should. Um, so that kind of balance of that reach and people knowing, everyone knowing the work you've done versus the, the personal ownership of it has just been, I think both are kind of have their merits. And I'm glad I, I'm very glad I did AAA for so long before doing this because the amount you learn being surrounded by like everything, everything on earth all it was just being surrounded by people like Will and just incredibly talented people that, that can teach you so much and that's much harder to get in a, in a tiny, tiny team. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that we recently hired um, a programmer, an audio programmer. He's been working in the industry for 15 years. He was in Codemasters Ubisoft. You know, and he left to join us, like a small team of eight people, because he wanted to do something different. And he was very specialized, doing the same thing for many years. And now, you know, he, he has the whole project. He has to make the, ver the whole version for Vice, for example. So the whole project by himself, I mean, he has support from the rest of the team, but he's the main leader of, the, of this project. So. Yeah, I guess it's more exciting to be in a small team because you get to create uh, yeah, something. I mean, you're kind of going the opposite way to a degree. I mean, you started with your university your master's project and you're scaling up now. So, I mean, how do you find that transition? Is it quite interesting in similar ways? Or is it just yeah, that's interesting as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, before I had worked in big teams in terms of like studios and commercials, like location sound studios, things like that. But um, yeah, now it's a different transition is from um, a, a technical um, audio uh, person to more like a business kind of managing teams, but also doing a bit of audio person. <laughs> so it's uh, it's interesting. It's um, it's it's challenging, but it's also interesting because you get to do different things. You can choose what you do, and you see how something grows from nothing to a, to you know to a, to a company. So it's quite a it's quite exciting. It's, it's different, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely an experience. Cool. Um, just check the team. Cool, so we might open up the floor for questions if anybody has any burning ones right over here. I will. Um, Sorry. Pass this mic <laughs> Can you please be a runabout, please? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, which way am I going to go? Hello. Um, I, I work in. Um, game writing and story and narrative and narrative design and all that kind of stuff. In terms of like cross-departmental stuff as audio people, and I've worked with a bunch of audio teams, but I've never really asked them, is there a habit or a trait or, or just something that people working with you outside the department, you know, what are the top habits or one or two of the top habits that you love people to, to have if you're working with them closely, uh, if, if that's if that makes sense. Because I'm always kind of curious, am I making your life easier or am I being a pain in the ass, you know, sometimes, and I have to really ask people that sometimes. Um, 
Advance warning is the yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. Come to us early. Whatever it is, tell me early, not late. That's absolutely it. There's no real bad news because you're probably going to do whatever it is anyway. So hearing about it as soon as possible is, I think, the killer, the killer thing beyond anything else. Okay. Do Do you think that because and then I'm actually going to give this mic back, but do you feel that um, as as a writer, we feel that we're often told quite late about things, of course, so we bitch about that too, understandably. Do you feel that, so audio is, is obviously behind that step as well, because obviously once the writing's been done, then you guys get to do your thing, right? Is that is that the way it is, or do you think sometimes it's flipped? Yeah, d definitely. Um, you know, especially working on big games where there is very dialogue heavy, quite frequently um, the the design of the game and the level design is going to dictate parts of the story, parts of the narrative, at least, at the very least, the dialogue. Um, and those things will change until the game goes gold anyway. So, you know, you, you as a narrative designer are going to be, you know, second in line compared to the design, and then it's the audio folk that are third in line that then have to, you, you know, you, you'll take a problem from the design folk, we'll take your solution and implement it basically. Um, so it is, it's, it's just communication really. You know, if, if everybody's talking often and frequently and, 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 and as early as possible, as soon as anybody gets an inkling that something's gonna change, um, if, so, if somebody's looking into that, then you know, every, everybody's on the same page and everybody wants the game to be good. So mm -hmm. people's gonna do what they can to make things work. Okay, thanks. Oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, is there anything you would say to your former self, let's say, is there anything you want to know, that you, you want to tell your former self that you, that it's really, really useful and you couldn't, yeah, you could have saved yourself a lot of, a lot of hassle if you knew it when you were starting? <laughs> 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 yeah, listen more at college. Um, there, there was a lot of things when when I was at college. I was looking at the career as a music-based thing at that time. When I was eighteen, I just wanted to go into game music, and and that was the thing. And the sound effects was a, was a very secondary part of my 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 ambition at that point. And a lot of the time, we were learning the scientific stuff at college. And at the time, I remember thinking, "This, this is never going to be useful for anything." And um, you know, sort of ten years later, and I'm working at Rockstar, and I'm you know synthesising um, sirens, and it's like I'm kind of glad I know what a slew rate is now. You know, it's these these little nuggets of information that came back from college ten, fifteen years previously that you know helps you solve these problems. You just don't know what you're gonna need to know. So it's it's a cliche, but knowledge is definitely power. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that hard work pays off. You know, sometimes it's difficult to think you think you cannot make it, you think you are, you know, an imposter or something, or you can do things, but, you know, if you try hard, I think everyone can do anything in a way. And, yeah, I mean, things that uh, I regret or I would do differently, um, I don't know, I had some issues with, uh, it was difficult, challenging, in my perspective, uh, working with other people in the beginning, hiring people and having this uh, dif different kind of relationship of, uh, you know, you pay someone to do something. So, I mean, I've learned a lot in terms of how to work with people and um, this is kind of um, thing that you learn by doing in a way. Um, so, I would say, yeah, listen more to people with more experience and also have people around you with more experience than you and try to learn from them. Um, because this happened to me a lot in terms of the business as well, but also audio in, in general. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, surrounding yourself by people better than you is the key thing. Um, and also, I think, going back to saying earlier, of kind of knowing a decent amount about everything around your field, I think I was slow, so that I wish I was to do that. I think I thought other areas were either not interesting or none of my business or hard, and spending a little bit of time looking around everything nearby you just get a much better picture of the kind of world around what you're doing. I think I've, I felt I was slow to that, but mainly just surround yourself by better people than you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, are you saying um, about uh, that a couple of you sort of fell into the job 
sort of learn on the job. But nowadays, how important would you say it is to maybe study formally? And if it's not so important, how do you go about teaching yourself? Um, whether or not this is relevant, and I don't want to upset anybody, I, I genuinely have never looked at people's qualifications when they've, um, when they've sent applications to me. Um, however, that's not to say that education isn't valuable because um, 15, 20 years ago in the 90s when, when I was sort of getting a, a foothold and you know, freelance game audio before I became full time, the barrier of entry was, was so low. I mean, you know, the, the, the technology that we were all using back then was, was ridiculous. You know, it required a huge amount of investment just to pr produce the most basic stuff. And the barrier of entry was, was, was so different then to now that my personal opinion is that you've got to know a bit about everything. You've got to know so much more now than we would have done back then to be able to, to get a, a decent start. And your university and your college is the absolutely perfect opportunity to do that. It's the perfect opportunity to meet other like-minded people, either in games or in films. There's, there's always, there's so many more opportunities for sound people now in games and in different industries than there, have, you know, than there ever has been before, um, and it is just, you know, use that time at college to not just learn everything, but to also do everything, because that's the it's probably the last time that you'll get to spend that amount of time doing your own thing. <laughs> yeah, I did say that very much. I think I used to be I was ready to be academic, and I think in my years thought it was a valuable thing for other people, and it's certainly all during the kind of rockstar years. I don't think there was any correlation between. Um, the quality of people we got in and their academic qualifications. It was just a scatter gun of, of good people from, and, and sometimes bad people from both kind of extremes. But as, not very many people, but um, as Will says, I think it's less about the actual qualification and more about that being a great environment to, to meet other people and to be able to explore and to be surrounded by people interested in the same things with the same resources. And I see stuff like Dare to be Digital and things, the amount of the amount of kind of, if you like, vocational almost things surrounding a course rather than the qualification itself these days is crazy good. There was nothing like that when back in my day. And I think that's so much more useful than the actual bit of paper you get at the end of it. The people that have always impressed me lately are the people that have put the effort in to do those extra things and to do the stuff beyond the core bit of their course. And that's why I think probably it's easy, so much easier to get into that sort of stuff in a formal um, qualification situation. So I think that's the huge value I see these days. Yeah, I think um, yeah, starting something is uh, it's if you like it is uh, it's good, but if you do it just before because because you want to, but because they tell you to do it, I think it's it's, it's pointless. So I think yeah, people like if they want to a career in something specific, I mean that's a good way to start. But then uh, yeah, when when you take a CV or when you want to hire something someone, the, the most important thing is experience a portfolio. Um, and sometimes we even send tests, you know, just do this or to see how um, how people can do things. So I mean, the, um, that's that's very important. So um, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have if you have a PhD. I mean, we had people with PhDs that were not as good as people with you know no degrees. It doesn't. Um, uh, it's not relevant, but I mean, it helps. And also, as uh, as Matthew and Will said, I mean, it's very important to meet people um, at university. And especially the master's degree here, it was really, really good because most people had already experience in the field, so it was um, it's really uh, good for um, networking and meeting people that can impact your life later on in terms of your, your career life, and you can work with them. And yeah, it's a, it's a good environment to be in if you're interested in this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, just add something on there. Uh, I know a lot of universities these days have game dev societies and a lot of and Cali definitely do. So it's worth getting involved in them as well because like again once you it's what I found at university, not to diss anything, but it was the people I met were more important than the actual piece of paper I've got. Um, I mean in total we've been working together now for five years. We've been a foreign company for almost three now and still kind of going strong. So it's it's very much getting working with people, finding out what can happen. I know other people that have been involved with game jam groups, or uh, well, there's another example, game jams are worth going to as well, but Chris made that clear at their societies who have managed to maybe make a go of it themselves uh, in their own company or get a job out of that as well. So it's definitely worth meeting as many people as you can in that regard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guy down the front, still. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I know it's a basic question, but um, I do graphics and um, I was just sort of thinking, how would you develop sound for, say, user interfaces or menus, for example, stuff that's not exactly what you'd say um, you could just record off the street or something? That's another one where it's great fun to experiment and, and you know, the, the old things where you hear about, you know, the, the neon tubes for lightsabers and stuff, it's like just, just find something to record it and see what happens, you know, different mics, different techniques, you don't even have to do that, you could do it all out of the box with, with plugins. Um, I mean, quite frequently with those sort of sounds, we kind of just set a recorder going and just do things and you know, we'll record a thousand things and maybe strip it down to half a dozen to find the ones that we that we like the sound of. Um, however, it's not just a free for all. You know, you've got to make things make sure that things are stylistically compatible and you know that they do match visuals and you know you, you've got to think about brands and, and whatnot. So, yeah, it's, it's it's just get your hands dirty and have fun. Make, make you know make the most of those jobs because those ones don't come around that often. Yeah, exactly. I would say, yeah. um, and also here you can use different synthesizers and tools like in FM synthesis, different things for, for UI and you know things that sound like a button. You can record a button and then you can uh, combine it with the synthesizer and add different layers of things. So yeah, it's it's experimentation. Um, you can also search online for tutorials, things like that, um, to see how what other people have done. You can use plugins. So yeah, there are many options, but it's definitely very exciting and creating creative process. So. Yeah, this is all that, and then just kind of simplify. I think every UI sound I've ever heard be good was was about ten times as complex and as loud the week before. It's just strip it back, so you're not going to hear this thing over and over again. So find something good and then just remove ninety percent of it. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. I don't see the <laughs> uh, Just really quickly, you're all under the small to medium enterprises and you came from established AAA games companies and built up your own companies. I just wanted to find out what would you say is the focus for people who are either running their own company or they're trying to do it freelance? What would you say the main challenges, the main focuses for actually drawing attention to, to what they can offer in the industry? So um, are you referring specifically to um, a matter of exposure? Yeah, it's just basically getting showing the companies what you can offer, um, so that they they yeah. know what they're choosing, they know what they're getting. Um, people usually won't come to you. It's not like you pick up a newspaper and you pick somebody to come and fix your roof. Um, so you know you, you can you can have a, a nice web presence, but generally you won't get much interest from that. Um, and a lot of the time you'll get recommendations via people that you know, either people that have taken work and have been offered work and can take this. Um, so again, it's, it's always good to have this circle of, you know, this network of, of, of friends and, and peers in the industry. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these weird things where you, you automatically assume that you're all in the same industry, you're all competing against each other, but at the same time everybody's proud of what they do, everybody's proud of the the video game audio industry, everybody wants it to be better, ultimately, you know, so if somebody can't take work, they're going to pass it on to somebody that they know can do it. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, like Orpheus has said that about going to GDC and develop, um, it's a, a real, I mean, they're, they're, they're great fun, but it's, it's a really great thing to be going and meeting people, talking to folk and find out what they're doing. Um, not just for, for the sake of being nosy and, and getting excited about it, but also because it does um, open doors and, and you do make friends and, and people will want to work with people that they like. So, you know, do, do, do try and meet people. It's, it definitely works. Yeah, it's, a, it's all about people. So, you know, you need to be nice and easy to work with and that's, that's very important. You know, if you're difficult, then it's going to be difficult to find uh, people to work with. Um, in terms of being a freelancer and starting your own thing, I, I would say learn as much as you can about, you know, not only not about not only about your field but also business in general. Some basic stuff to understand how the system works, um, and then yes, surround yourself with uh, people that, as we mentioned before, that you know they're good and they're better. They have a lot of experience, and um, because they can help you move forward, uh, and networking, all these kind of things, yeah. and also you know, you don't have to necessarily. I mean. The thing that I learned about the startup is that you don't have to do it yourself. 
so you can even make a team, you know. Um, I know people that started studios that do a lot of work in the in the game uh, industry, sound design, that, you know, they just have two friends, or like, so we start a company, yeah, you know, I'll be the audio director, I'll be the, the sound designer, I'll be the sound engineer, whatever, and then they started going to events, can start meeting people, and you know, they, they, they now they're doing really, really well, so uh, that's, that's another way to do it. And actually Edinburgh is a great place to be for startups, so if you have an idea or anything, um, uh, uh, it's innovative and you think it can move forward, then there are a lot of people that can help you, so advice. And, yeah. yeah, not much more to say, I totally agree with all that. I think the whole be nice um, is, what that I think really means is people don't really want like a particular service, they want a problem kind of solved, and if working with you is going to add problems, they're not interested. You have to be someone that, that people think of, oh, if I go to them, this issue in my life will go away. Um, and that's something what being nice really means, isn't it? And getting out there and meeting people so that it occurs to them that you're someone that can make that problem go away. It was interesting what you were saying about experience, and um, I was just wondering what would be the best way to get experience in the industry? I know you can do your own personal projects and that's very well and good for portfolio, but how would one who's starting out actually get experience in the industry? Um, more difficult than, it's, it, it, it's quite a, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody here has already found out that it's quite a competitive um, thing to get your, your foot in the door. Um, but it's, I mean, I remember being at college and, and that was in Newcastle and there were studios around at the time and I tried to get work experience and I just couldn't. Um, and that was impossible at the time. And you know, the, the, the six weeks promised work experience was kind of just do your own thing and hope you get a job. Um, so it's, it's probably not changed much, I would, I would assume now. And it's still, you know, difficult to get somebody to let you in. Um, it does happen in, you know, depending on the place, it, it can happen that people that go into a firm in one department can be poached by another department. Um, so you do find QA folks sometimes um, being called upon for assistance with tasks from, from audio folk and they end up, may end up being transferred full time into audio. It's not the sort of thing I would recommend as a, as a plan, but it, it, that can happen. Um, I actually don't know much about internships, to be honest, so I don't know if off here, so Matthew, you know either, anything? Um, well, yeah, if you find an internship, I mean, I've applied for a lot of internships and I didn't get into it, so, um, well, I get, I got one in Greece, but not here, I mean, um, yeah, it's an, it, it's an interesting one, um, usually helps if you know people, so, I mean, uh, it's easier to get interested in, in uh, you know, a job or a junior position in, in the industry. Um, but, I mean, the other thing you could do is try to, um, again, create as much content as you can and then go to places that you can meet these people and ask, you know, you can ask someone to, you know, if you want any help, you know, I can help you with the sound recording or, you know, sound design. Yeah, you can do it for free for a bit, not for too long because that, yeah, that's not good either. But yeah, you can help. I mean, when I started, I did a lot of work for free. Um, so I mean that's that's another thing you know you could potentially do, but again it's all about um, a combination of you know networking skills, learning a lot of things, um, and just try to you know get out there and have have presence. Follow social media. There are a lot of forums there for audio and for very specific things. And if you start posting interesting things, you know the people that go in, into the industry from different things. You know, other people um, started as, from a small company, other people started as QA testers and then they became like sound designers or whatever. Other people just started a blog, just writing about stuff and then everyone knows them because they have this, you know, awesome blog. Um, so there are many ways to do it. You just have to find your own unique kind of uh, way in, you know. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I'd certainly second the whole QA as a actually pretty good route. Um, I think it is pretty great because you you are doing real work that gets to see a huge range of the departments so I, of, a, of a company. So actually, it is pretty damn good way of doing it. Also, I think don't be scared of just approaching people when they're not advertising for jobs. Um, I think just get a contact and um, write to people and 
and try and open a conversation with them and see what comes about. I've always found it surprising how few, you used to get a lot of applications for a, a job advert, but very, very few unsolicited things, apart from people wanting to just have their music in the game. But other than that, people actually wanted to kind of work in the game, very, very few. So I think, and most people I think are quite, say a few nice things and, and show you actually care about the particular projects that they're working on. Um, and people I think will probably take some interest and you'll get some hit rate back from that, I think. Anybody else? No? Cool. Last chance. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for coming and I want to put your hands together for three gents up here. <laughs>